Hello and welcome to uh, this new video on elements of van der Waals interactions for molecules and colloids. In this video we'll continue directly from where we left last time um, uh, discussing basically the electrostatics um, of dipoles. So um, if you remember we stopped at looking at a cartoon where we saw how two dipoles were interacting together and basically how uh, they want to be aligned um, with each other and also they, once they are aligned they tend to attract each other. If for some reason we were to have opposite uh, directions between the two dipoles then they would repel each other. Right, so now the question we ask is what happens if we have two such dipoles but then they are subject to thermal motion and in particular random thermal motion which make their orientation change uh, with time. So here for example the um, top dipole will be uh, fluctuating around um, and of course its orientation will change and as a consequence the energy will change as well. So because we can't exactly have a very uh, a particular definite orientation between the two dipoles what we have to resort to is basically compute averages um, of the energy uh, over all the possible orientations. So what we need to do is basically um, to replace uh, this idea of definite uh, energy with average uh, potential energy of the dipoles and this average is over all possible orientations or relative orientations between the dipoles. Um, so that's what we'll be looking at and so what we do is basically we, we uh, keep the distance fixed between the dipoles, we um, look at all the possible orientations and how they are affected, uh, how they are possible depending on, on thermal fluctuations and then we look at what is the actual average value of the potential energy. So for example um, in this particular case you would move like this you see that the energy in the energy meter is actually moving around about a specific average value and this average value will be let's say over here so it's like you need here the red arrow to, to see where it is but it's in the right top right corner uh, of, the, uh, of the plot on the right hand side now you can now change the distance between uh, the two dipoles and play again the same game. So here you change again, you average over all possible fluctuations and you try to see what is the uh, average value and you would find something slightly lower. And that makes sense because then the uh, intensity or magnitude of the electric field is actually higher. Okay, The electric field of the central dipole is actually higher. Now if you get even closer then you continue again to look at the fluctuations. You see now that of course uh, if you can fluctuate up to almost 90 degrees then that will correspond to a huge jump in, um, in energy and this is very unlikely. Okay, So overall they tend to be more aligned, the energy seems to be lower and you get something along this line. So something very very uh, sharply different from before and that's because not only it's more and more unlikely for um, uh, for high uh, magnitude uh, change in orientation but also because the magnitude of the electric field decays very non-linearly uh, close to, to the dipole. Overall if you were to do that for every single point uh, from let's say 0 to, uh, to 2 here on this graph you would find a curve like this that goes as minus uh, a constant c which is positive divided by y to the 6. Now this if in effective interaction that emerges uh, when you uh, uh, keep the distance fixed and then you average over all possible orientations uh, is called the um, uh, Kiesum van der Waals interaction between two permanent dipoles. Now besides the Kiesum interaction it turns out that there are two other types of dipole interactions which give rise to the same minus 1 over r to the sixth functional form. And because of that these two types and in fact and Kiesum uh, interaction are all called van der Waals 
type uh, interaction. Now the first one um, is a double is a Dubai uh, dipole induced dipole interaction, which accounts for nonpolar molecules interacting with polar molecules. And these polar molecules, in fact, will induce a dipole into nonpolar molecules, and then they will interact in the way I've described before. Now the other one is called the London induced dipole induced dipole interaction, and then in this case. Basically, you have two nonpolar molecules, and then uh, basically quantum fluctuations will make some um, polarity pop up in one of the molecules, which will in turn induce uh, a polarization of the other molecule, and then they interact in the way I've described before. And so overall, if you talk about von der Waals interaction between molecules, then you have to sum up these three contribution which will appear normally in most molecules. It could be that sometimes the Kism and Dubai do not exist, but in each time you've got to deal with let's say water molecules and these three of them have to be accounted for. Okay, so for now we have seen how two molecules interact with each other. Um, now, it turns out that colloids are not molecules, and we have seen that, in fact, they are much bigger objects than that. So, how do they interact via the von der Waals force? This was not really resolved between the 30s, at least uh, there was no really uh, ways to, to, to discuss it be before the 30s, and then, uh, basically, somebody came up with the following idea. So, if you consider two colloids, okay, colloid 1 and colloid 2, and they would have radius R1 and R2 respectively. And then you fix their distance that you call small r. So there's a center to center distance between the colloids. Now, because they are macroscopic or mesoscopic materials, then they contain more than one molecule. And here, for this description, you need to specify how many molecules per uh, unit volume you have in these colloids. So you need to specify the number density, that's how it's called, N1 for colloid 1, and number density N2 for colloid 2. Now once you've done that, you can actually uh, basically look at specific points, let's say P1 and P2, on colloid 1 and colloid 2 respectively. About these two points, uh, about first, let's say, point one, you can look at volume, okay, a neighboring volume, um, dv1, in which you know that you will have n1 dv1 molecules, okay? And the same thing is true for uh, p2, you can have a, a, a neighboring volume dv2 about p2, in which you will have n2 dv2 molecules. Now, because we know how two molecules interact with each other, two, let's say, dipole molecules or, uh, or, or, or apolar molecules, in fact, we know that they have a von der Waals interaction, then we can say that these two volume elements uh, will interact in the following way. So this is minus C12, okay, so molecules 1 and 2 interact with a constant C12, if you will, uh, and then divided by P P1, P2 uh, to the 6, and then times the number of molecules involved in the process. Now here P1, P2 is nothing but the vector that goes from P1 to P2. So this is how two tiny fragments of the colloids interact with each other via the van der Waals interaction. But if you want to know the total interaction, then you need to integrate over all possible points P1 and P2 in colloid 1 and in colloid 2. So this is quite a complicated integral to compute, and I won't actually delve into details of this calculation in this lecture. What you need to know is that the actual solution to this integral reads like so. So this is um, a quite cumbersome expression, uh, that looks a little bit scary, uh, but if you analyze um, each term, uh, then you see it's actually quite simple, in fact. So it's, you start with minus 
a constant that is called a12 that we'll discuss in the next slide uh, in, in one of the next slides to come divided by 6 okay and then times 2 r1 r2 this is a number okay r1 and r2 are numbers divided by r squared minus r1 plus r2 squared so it's basically 1 over x squared minus constant okay so it's just a very simple function plus 2 times r1 r2 which is a number again divided by r squared minus r1 minus r2 squared so again this is a function of the kind 1 divided by x squared minus constant and then plus the log of basically a function of the kind x squared minus constant divided by x squared minus constant so um, you see that it's quite a simple function in fact or at least uh, it uses very simple functions which all can be plotted uh, by using uh, a high school uh, calculator um, and so overall this is the reason why th this formula is very important because although it looks cumbersome uh, it is uh, encapsulating all the interactions between two colloids so the van der Waals interactions between two spherical colloids and also you can plot it quite easily uh, with a calculator but if you were to be unhappy with the cumbersomeness or you have difficulties to figure out what's going on there are ways to um, have some more insight about it um, and in fact you get that by looking at limiting cases and there are two of them one which is when the colloids are very far apart from each other so when they are very very far apart so when r the center to center distance is much bigger than the uh, radii of the or the sum of the radii of the colloids then you get that the van der Waals interaction goes as minus a12 v1 v2 which which are the two volumes of of the colloid so v1 colloid uh, is the volume of the colloid 1 and v2 volume of colloid 2 divided by r to the 6 this is very interesting because what it tells you is that when the two colloids are very far from each other they should behave like two dipoles and that, that's normal because they, they just look like points when they are super far away from each other so they just become like two point dipoles with a specific magnitude that involves the total volume of course of the particles something a little bit different happens when you uh, look at what's going on at close range so when the uh, basically the center to center distance is about the size of the, in, the, uh, the sum of the radii okay so in that case what it means is that the surface to surface distance is very very small and in that case you actually get this particular result that this is minus a12 divided by 6 times l1 r2 uh, r1 r2 divided by r1 plus r2 and then times l where l here is the surface to surface distance which is r minus r1 plus r2 it turns out that this particular expression would be the van der Waals interaction between two infinite plates okay so here again you get some insight because it first the range of decrees uh, is now is 1 over L okay so it's, it's the power of decay is much lower than that of uh, the van der Waals between point dipoles and I think this is something incredibly important to notice and to emphasize and secondly it tells you that when two spherical colloids are close enough to each other then basically they are equivalent to two plates uh, facing each other and so everything becomes much simpler as well okay so the last thing I want to discuss is this constant a12 uh, this this is called the Hamaker constant and it plays a crucial role to um, basically get a quantitative picture or at least semi quantitative picture of what's going on in most materials this um, constant was estimated, or at least its expression was estimated back in 1937 when Hamaker calculated the, uh, the integral that I showed before and he found that it was pi squared times c12 n1 n2 now c12 here would be the interaction would be the constant associated to the interaction between two molecules in vacuum 
And it turns out that if you use this particular expression, the problem is that it doesn't compare well with experiments. It is sometimes like f like two or three orders of magnitude uh, off from the experiments. Uh, so that's one of the issues. And the other issue is, is the other issue is that it does not account for what's going on if these colloids are interacting through another medium than vacuum. So this was an issue, and then this was solved partially. Uh, and then refined by other people by Lifshitz, who proposed that the uh, Amaker constant should be written as a one m two, and then uh, here you what it says is that you are looking at the interaction between um, colloid one, if you will, and colloid two through medium m. And basically, the interaction of this sorry, the value of the constant goes at three half of k b t where Kb is still the Boltzmann constant and T is the temperature, and then times epsilon 1 minus epsilon m divided by epsilon 1 plus epsilon m times the same thing basically but for epsilon 2. Now of course I need to specify what are these symbols. So here I make a constant is again between 1 and 2 across m. Now, epsilon 1 is the dielectric permittivity of colloid 1, which is a macroscopic way of talking about polarization in materials. Epsilon 2 is the dielectric permittivity of colloid 2. And finally, epsilon m is the dielectric permittivity of medium 1. This formula is super crucial, and for the reasons that to be explained just now, uh, so we have seen that this, it looks like this, okay? And now there are two possible options, okay? First is that the product epsilon 1 minus epsilon m with epsilon 2 minus epsilon m is bigger than zero. If that happens, then the interaction is attractive between 1 and 2, okay? Because Hamaker constant becomes positive, and the van der Waals interaction is minus the Hamaker constant, and therefore it's attractive. Now, the fact that it's attractive plays a crucial role, of course, in colloids, and we'll, we'll see that in the next lectures to come, but it also plays a crucial role in many other things. And here I want to emphasize one of these other things, uh, which is that this is what explains, in fact, why, for example, beetles fly spiders and geckos, which are much more bigger uh, animals, can actually uh, stick on almost any surface. Okay, so this is mostly due to attractive van der Waals interaction between the legs um, of, the, of these animals and the uh, walls they are sticking on. Now, there is another possibility, which is that epsilon 1 minus epsilon m times um, epsilon 2 minus epsilon m is less than zero. And in that case, what happens is that you get repulsive interactions. This, of course, plays a crucial role when you've got colloidal mixtures, and, uh, and this can be looked at uh, also later on. However, it also plays a role in everyday, uh, let's say, experience. And in particular, this is the reason why you've got water condensation on your windows in your, when you are in your car when there is basi basically cold weather. And, and here is the point here is that one would be, let's say, the window and two would be the air. And the medium interfacing these two or, uh, or across uh, them would be water, liquid water. And it turns out that you can interpret that if there is repulsion between glass and air, uh, when there is in between liquid water, then that means that you prefer to grow liquid water or condensate liquid water at the interface uh, between uh, air and, and the window. And this explains why condensation happens on the window and not on you, for example. Okay, so I will finish this van der Waals part uh, here, and then uh, in the next lecture we'll actually delve into the electrostatics uh, of charge colloids.